Welcome to today's talk where the title is Modern Approaches to Profiling in Python with Scaling. Okay, so um, the number one thing that I'm going to suggest as part of this talk, if you do not listen to anything else I say and you just use me for background noise for the next hour is please, 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 please use the wiki. Okay, if you have any questions about Python or about installing things or virtual environments or Jupyter notebooks or any anything that I'm saying or any of these comparisons, go read the wiki. That's your first place. Because if you send us a ticket and that ticket is kind of like a general question, the first thing we're going to do is send you back to the wiki and ask you a question in terms of it. Okay, so always check the wiki no matter what, especially for Python as it's different than your local system, I can almost guarantee it. Okay, and if you can't find what you're looking for and you still have questions, that's totally fine. Uh, you, you can reach us at help at sharknet.ca and it'll be directed to some expert, uh, me, Sergey, or anyone else. Okay, awesome. Uh, so today's outline is um, gonna look a little bit something like this. We've got some uh, rhetorical questions here. We love Python, but it's slow. You know, why don't people just switch away from Python? What do people do exactly when they need to go faster in Python? We're going to talk briefly about some other profilers uh, other than scaling. Um, we're going to introduce scaling, and I'll talk a little bit of the nerdy details of how they were able to do some of these things uh, that they were able to achieve. We'll do um, a soft live demo, as uh, I tried it last night, and uh, it did not go smoothly, so we might <laughs> pivot a little bit there. We've got two toy problems to discuss, and then at the end, I'll take questions, okay? So the idea here at the end of this talk is hopefully you will be sold on using Scalene in your own projects, especially as you run them uh, in these HPC environments that we support. Okay, last but not least, um, there is a GitHub uh, for this talk that I'm using, the slides are in, and all of the examples. So I'll link that more towards the end of the talk, okay? Awesome. All right. So why Python? Uh, I've got this little point here. Let me count the ways. We've got the easier learning curve. We've got scikit-learn, numpy, pandas. We've got all the nice plotting libs like matplotlib, plotly. We've got the way we can call other languages and interface with the system. You've got your rapid prototyping. You've got Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, this slide actually goes off the page because I was just listing things off the top of my head. There's numerous, numerous, numerous reasons to want to write in Python and be happy writing in Python. Um, and it and it's awesome because of that, right? But awesome isn't free. And I have this kind of expansion on that on that sentence that is each abstraction must provide more benefit than the cost. And that's actually from a talk about C and C plus plus from 2019. Okay. So in my opinion, you know, there there are some downsides to Python and we'll talk about them shortly. But they're worth it. They're a good trade, right? Like we get all these nice good things that I've listed up above, but we, we do lose out some, okay? Now, I don't know if you're a Python person. I'm I'm kind of one of the Python people at SharkNet. Um, this is going to have happened to you, which is somebody's going to say, yeah, but it sure is slow. Like Python is slow. And that person's your friend, your coworker, your supervisor, anything like that. And they're right. They're just they're just right. It is slower, no matter how you slice it. It's going to be slower. And so a, a good question is: Do you need to care? You know, will I ever need it to be faster? Does does performance matter? Okay. So yes, <laughs> that is that is my conclusion. All right. So if you're working on parsing, you know, JSON and just doing some small things in pandas, and you're doing kind of data manipulation on the scale of like something that can fit in Excel, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe your performance doesn't strictly matter, but we're an HPC group. We're talking about running these jobs on a cluster. So definitely performance matters, all right? So let's talk about that a little bit more and expand on that. How many simulations do you need to run in your field? It's just kind of an open question. Uh, in mine, at the time, it was like, you know, 30 to 50 runs, maybe 100 would be nice. Maybe you're one of the unlucky few who has to do millions or billions of runs and you're in some sort of particle physics. Well, performance really matters then, you know, like if you need a billion runs and they take an hour, you're, you're in trouble, right? The next thing here is memory footprint. We don't always talk about memory performance when we don't think of memory performance when we say performance, but it's a big consideration, right? You know, if, if you're trying to submit a job to the cluster, 
the difference between how soon your job will run if you request 100 gigs versus 8 gigs is a se several orders of magnitude in terms of responsiveness from the scheduler. It also is true for cloud computing in terms of if you have some workload that's running in the cloud, it's entirely possible that what you need with your large memory footprint is prohibitively expensive or they just don't offer it. Okay, next thing is kind of scheduler priority. Okay, so it, the more that you're using, you should you should get everything out of it. You know, if you submit a job that runs for an hour, it should be as efficient as possible to make sure that, you know, you're paying with your priority on our systems, this fair share. You're not paying any money, but it's kind of, you know, if you run for 100 hours in a day, you're not running 100 hours the next day, most likely, right? So if you're going to use that 100 hours, let's make it as efficient as possible. So performance definitely matters as you go to an HPC scale and you scale up your workloads. Okay, so how would I go about avoiding Python slowness, right? Like the question becomes, all right, uh, I'm in Python and this is this is my life now. Um, how can how can I avoid it? How do I just make Python better? <laughs> so I, I've got this this kind of note here. So nerd stuff ahead. Um, if you don't care about the the lower level details, don't worry so much about this. Okay, but this might come as a surprise to some of the people with a computer science background. Uh, an integer in C, four bytes. Okay, check mark. Python, 24 bytes. There's a whole bunch of baggage that comes with everything in Python. I believe that a dictionary, an empty dictionary in Python was somewhere in the realm of 300 up until recently. So you're, you're just dealing with those sorts of things in Python. And you can't just not use dictionaries, right? So how about list access? All right, well, if you're in C, you read the memory address, and then based on the type, you read it in offset and you return. Mostly, that's a simplification, right? So that's great. That's like really quick. Even if you don't kind of follow what I'm getting at, it's basically you just read at a spot and you interpret it and send that value back. Great. In Python, this is just a simplification of what happens. You have to make sure the variable you're indexing into the list is numeric. Okay, that's a check. You have to determine whether it's in bounds. Okay, great. And if it's negative, you have to start, you know, manipulating the list to do all of those wraparound kind of magic things and more. Like that's going to be slower. So no matter what, list access and all these different things in Python are just plain slower. There's nothing you can do about that in base Python. Okay. So some not so fun facts there at the bottom are more statically typed languages are just going to be faster. Those are the C and C worlds out there, anything like that. And interpreted languages like Python are just going to be slower because they can't take uh, advantage of some like hardware optimizations or um, just code optimizations that regular compilers do. And we'll talk about this again in a little bit. So you basically can't if you stay in pure Python, which is a bit of a spoiler for what's coming next. Okay, so why don't people swap languages? Uh, maybe you're one of those people who uh, has suggested, you know, just write it in, just write it in Perl, just write it in this. Perl is also an interpreted language, right? But like, you know, just use this sort of thing, just do that sort of thing. Well, here are some fun facts or some not so fun facts um, for you to take into consideration, or maybe you're in this slide. Uh, number one, some people are not computer science students. I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget that. Some people take a single semester of a programming course and they make do from there. And in that course, their IDE and all of those things are just instantly set up for them. Okay, so they don't ever need to worry about how do I link VS code for code completion? How do I, you know, set up Visual Studio so that it's using like memory profiling properly? Like that's not trivial stuff to somebody who's just starting out. And that leads me into concepts like memory management, namespaces, threads. If we're talking about the Go programming language, uh, programming language that's, that would be like channels and slices and all the structs. Some of that stuff is not so easy to pick up if you're a beginner. Uh, a big one, and I've got a note here, if you want a free rant from me at the end, if you want to ask a free question, um, ask me about how I feel that like there's a lack of workspace things like Jupyter in other languages. That's a really big one. Jupyter Notebooks and those sorts of things are really nice for people learning and really great for rapid prototyping. And exactly what I have there, prototyping is just plain easier. And then the last one, which is a big one, is if you are a grad student, often what happens is you land in a lab, you are handed the previous student's code, and maybe it's written in Python, which for the purposes of this talk it is, 
you can't just switch away, right? You can't just rewrite that entire code, okay? If you were able to do something like that, then you know we're in a different uh, skill level here. Okay, so we can't just swap languages. Great. So then, what do people do? You know, this this is a solved problem for the most part. What do people do when they need to go faster? So I have three things here that I've kind of listed um, in a rough order of easier to harder, in my own opinion. Okay, so we're gonna demo. Um, the uh, one and three, the middle one, I actually have another talk on in the SharkNet YouTube. Uh, so if we go there and you search for Cython, my talk will come up and you can watch it. Uh, very similar style to this one with demos. Okay, so if you get uh, curious, go look there. Um, but one th number one is uh, just-in-time compiling through support like Numba. Number two is Cython, which is uh, a little bit more hands-on. And NumPy and vectorization is much, much more hands-on. You actually have to think about how you're coding a little bit differently, right? Okay, and you also have bigger problem uh, toolboxes. You've got you know, your scikits, your PyTorch, your TensorFlow. Um, you've got all of those different uh, modules that do all those um, fancy things for you. Okay, so I, I just want to bring your attention to something, and maybe you've never thought about this before, but I wanted to just present it like this. We have the packages NumPy, Cython, Numba, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, and I've got them in a table here. I've left out some, but they're all using or implemented with the same thing. So NumPy is C, C++, and Fortran. Yes, Fortran. Cython is C and C++. Okay. Numba leverages NumPy. Okay. Scikit-Learn, NumPy, Cython, PyTorch, C++. Okay, so what do they have in common, right? And you can go to the GitHub pages for these particular packages, and you can look, and you will see in that code breakdown on the right side of your screen that there's a lot more C and C++ in those packages than you might expect. Okay, awesome. So it's C all the way down, just like Turtles. It's C all the way down. Every single one of these very fast Python packages, Pandas, all of them, they're all C and C++ all the way down. They're all leveraging native languages, and they're going faster. That's their entire secret, OK? So I don't want to get too much into the technical details of like how that's being done and how those things are being called. But let's just briefly talk about why they're faster. I, I, I did mention a few things previously, but here are three kind of main points that I want to focus on today. So one. Uh, they're often compiled, these native languages, C, C++, these sort of lower level languages. Uh, they're compiled and can take advantage of optimizations for specific hardware. So this is this is a big one. If you have a particular um, like HPC setup, what you can get is packages and things that are tuned for the exact setup of the machine that you're running. Okay, so that's instruction sets. Um, memory access things, all that. You just don't get that in Python. You're not basic Python, okay? So the num uh, number two one there that I have is hyper-specific control of memory and it's access with less waste. So, you know, you have your actual uh, languages where you can call your malloc and free. You're explicitly in control of all of the memory and how it is interpreted uh, by the program. That's a big one. Python has a huge, 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 huge habit of just allocating and freeing memory whenever it feels like in small amounts. That's totally fine and normal. Remember, we like Python and it's done really great stuff for us, but that's just a fact, okay? So the last one here is stronger typing also. So this is the sort of thing where Python um, has training wheels, right? So like, it's totally fine to have a variable be a number and then all of a sudden start treating it like a string and now it's representing strings. In stronger typing languages, you just, you're not allowed to do that. In, in general, you have a variable and it is an integer and it will always be an integer. And what that allows you to do is do things like code optimization, which leads you back to point one here. Okay, so those are just three reasons. They're big, big, big ones. Um, if you tackle these sorts of three things, um, you're going to see very, very, very uh, large increases in speeds. OK, we have all of these background points in mind. I think we're all on the same page now. So how do we measure packages like these? Like, how would we even go about you know, looking at Python code that we've tried to attack with something like uh, Numba or Cython or NumPy? How, how do we even look at how efficient these sorts of things are? Like, we, we don't know. So 
the step, the, the first step, uh, and we all do it, but we shouldn't do it, but we all do it, is print line debugging. So don't do that. Hopefully today is definitely going to sell you on this technology, uh, so you don't have to do that anymore. Um, so the next step up would be uh, timing libraries. So any of those sort of time it things, the magic cells in Jupyter, any of that sort of stuff. Um, incidentally, those are actually problematic for uh, something I've termed nerd reasons here. We'll talk about it later. But uh, in some cases, if you ask Python to do something for 10 seconds, and then it calls C, and that C runs for a day, and then it finishes up with 10 seconds at the end, what you're actually going to see if you ask Python how long it ran is that it ran in 20 seconds. It's just a fact. OK, so you need a little bit more consideration than just basic time libraries. OK, so the next one up then would be, all right, I'm going to run my program and I'm going to watch HTOP, any of these sort of system uh, utilization tools. Uh, that's great. Um, I don't know about you, but I do like to eat and sleep. So you can't just watch HTOP for seven days as you're you know, doing your sort of scientific simulation or even hours. OK, it's just not going to work. So we arrive kind of unsurprisingly at the need for profilers, something that is going to take your code, wrap it, collect information about it in terms of memory, CPU time, all of these different sorts of things, and give you statistics and breakdowns on what it did. OK, so profilers are where we're at and what we're going to be focusing on. Awesome. So let's talk about Python profilers then. Um, if you're like me, um, you've given several talks on Python and you've even mentioned some of the things on the right side of this slide in the table there. So C profile, I've given talks on the line profiler too, uh, memory profiler as well. But something that like I previously didn't consider is the actual overhead of using a profiler, especially in an HPC environment where normally if your job takes you know, five days to run, if you want to profile it in an HPC environment, you do need to be worried about how much bigger that job is going to be now, right? And especially in terms of memory. So I have something over here, memory profiler. In the worst case, it is possible that if you have a job that's a day and you run it with memory profiler, it could be something like over 200 days to completely finish. And we'll talk about why that is later, but it has to do with tracking every single memory allocation that the Python uh, interpreter is doing. OK, next thing there is accuracy. So of course, but you would be surprised. Of course, it's important to be accurate. You don't want to tell your supervisor that I'm going to spend two weeks optimizing this code, and it's going to be twice as fast. And you finish the two weeks, and you run it, and it's no faster. That is a disaster. <laughs> they are not going to be happy, right? OK, and then lastly, which one do you even use over here, right? So in the blue box I have uh, on, the, on the right side there, those are all CPU profilers. And the bottom right ones are uh, in the green box. That is the uh, memory profilers, OK? So ideally, you know, you could do both. But it seems like with these profilers, you can't, at least these ones that I've selected here, OK? And this is just a, a point of order. Accuracy is actually a much bigger problem than you might expect. Um, you want to be as close to this green diagonal as possible when it comes to, um, you know, what is actually running in the runtime of things. You know, if you're using just the basic profile or C profile or Yappy, you, it's entirely possible you're on a wild goose chase and you're not even optimizing the piece of code that you think uh, is causing the largest impact to your runtime or memory footprint. Okay, so now. We're finally here. We're introducing scalene. 23 minutes, we're here. <laughs> OK, so scalene uh, brings together several different things. It brings CPU profiling. And importantly, it brings CPU profiling of uh, native code, so things running in C, C++, C++ or other things in the background, and Python. It does both of those things. Uh, it does memory profiling as well. At the same time, it's in the same mode. Uh, it can detect uh, memory leaks. Mostly, it, it will catch egregious memory leaks. It might not catch your small ones. Uh, it detects copying problems, as in um, data structures or just data in general being copied from Python into C and how much time is spent being doing that. It's totally fine to do that, and we do need to, but we don't want to do it too much. OK, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, it has both function and line profiling. You don't need to choose. You know, you don't want the situation where you know you run through a profiler. It takes three extra days, and it comes back and it says, "Yeah, uh, 
It's about here. Yeah, no, that's not great, right? So we have both. That's awesome. No need for decorators. You can just run your code. Um, instead of saying, you know, Python project.py, you say scalene project.py. We'll see that in just a second. It's very simple to run. The accuracy is as high as possible that they can get it. Great. And it also, and this is a big one for the HPC environment and our HPC enthusiasts in the room, uh, it has advanced support for threads, multiprocessing stuff, uh, and, and GPU uh, libraries through, I believe it's NVIDIA. So if you're using AMD things, you might be a little out of luck, but uh, yeah. Uh, and the last one here I've got in bold because it's kind of the new, the new hotness that everyone's kind of concerned about, and that is... The newer versions of Scalene, and I and I show what version I have, um, have built-in OpenAI suggestions for, you know, sections in your code that could be vectorized or improved. Okay. Awesome. So here we have the the big table, kind of where I took the snapshot of the one previously, that shows where we're at in terms of features. So if you look at this table, and of course this table is from their own making. Um, there's numerous, numerous features that scaling supports, and the overhead isn't too bad. Some somewhere to th in the realm of thirty to forty percent, which isn't so bad. It's not as bad as Memory Profiler, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, I see some people in the room whose names I recognize, who I know want to know the nerd stuff. So I'll talk about it briefly, and if you want to talk the um, very, very nerdy details, those are great for questions at the at the end. Okay, so nerd stuff ahead. Um, memory, how does it get away with tracking the memory without introducing a huge slowdown? Um, turns out Python likes to allocate memory. It sure likes to allocate small chunks of memory. If you track every malloc in free, that is how you get your crazy overhead. What Scalene does instead is it looks for deltas of about one megabyte. There's math reasons and fancy things in there that's advanced nerve stuff, but that's what it does. And what that allows you to do is track the memory in a way that you're still going to get the trends, you're going to see the memory consumption, um, but you're not tracking every malloc and free and having a whole bunch of overhead. Okay? Um, memory leaks. This one is kind of entering into advanced uh, nerd stuff, but basically how it works is with uh, token-based tracking of mallocs and free and sampling um, pieces of code to make sure that there's a... a required number of you know opens and closes or mallocs and freeze okay and lastly cpu time i kind of mentioned this briefly uh before if you have a piece of code that runs 10 seconds of python one year of math in numpy in one giant loop and then 10 seconds and you ask python how long it's been for this code to execute it'll just say the 20 seconds it doesn't have any notion of that there's good reasons for that and it makes sense why Python does this. Uh, that's entering advanced nerd stuff. We can talk about that later. It has to do with deferred signal delivery, if you're curious. Um, but what that actually allows us to do is, is infer that time spent not in Python. So like if we track the time between these signals that the Python interpreter has in the back end, big time deltas means we're executing non-Python code. Non-Python code is faster, so that's good. We want that anyway. That's the perspective that scaling takes. OK, awesome. So uh, just really briefly, we're going to talk about installing scaling. It totally works on the clusters uh, uh, almost entirely out of the box. Um, I'm running it on my local machine right now. And uh, that's where we'll be demoing a lot of the uh, um, uh, problems that we have coming up. So you can just simply do a pip install scaling. I didn't see any. Um, version conflicts with any of your standard canonical packages. So that was great. Um, if you want to, you know, follow along with my examples and try your own thing and have the same um, experience, I have version 1.5.21.2. Okay, so if you just want to be sure that we have the same thing, that's that there. Okay, so here's our first example with uh, with NumPy. This is a piece of code that's, um, it doesn't it doesn't particularly um, do anything, you know, we import NumPy, we have a function main, it makes an array, a big array, and then it makes a random uniform array. Okay, so I can tell you now that there is a problem with this code, and I've shown this example to a lot of people, um, some of my SharkNet friends who are in the audience already, right? Uh, and they know the answer, but I think they would agree that the, the answer to why this code is slow and problematic 
and I guess I should say slower and more problematic than it should be is really actually hard to spot. And it's something that scalene will help you spot. Okay, so if you can if you can guess the answer, thumbs up for you. All right, so how would we actually run something like this? So assuming you have that function and that code in a um, file called problem1.py, all you have to do is say in your command line interface, scalene and problem1.py, and you're good to go. Okay, so what it'll do from there is open up a new tab uh, or window in your system's web browser, and it will show you the profiled version of your code from there. If you're running this on the cluster, uh, your mileage might vary a little bit. You might have to exit out of um, something that's trying to link you somewhere and like bring that file down, like SCP it down, and then open it in your web browser. But we can talk about that at the end if, uh, in the question period if you're interested, which I hope. Okay, this is the scaling UI. This is the start of it. And um, personally, I don't find it too overwhelming, but you might find it overwhelming. So very briefly here, we're going to talk about all of the different things that you're seeing, and then we'll get a little bit more hands-on. Okay, up here in the top right in the red box, what we have is the kind of uh, bird's eye view of the overall performance of your Python program. So uh, what we're trying to do is make things as light blue or as light green as possible. And what that means is memory that is being worked on and worked with that is not in Python, that's going to just be better, and executing code and time spent um, not in Python, because it's just going to be faster. That's the reality that we kind of all agreed on earlier in the talk, right? So up here in the top right, we see those kind of breakdowns. We're spending a decent amount of time in um, uh, your native code. We have a decent amount of native memory going on, um, and we have a big chunk of memory, actually, but it's got some of these strange sawtoothy patterns to it. That's, that's kind of strange, and more on that later. That's kind of related to the problem, and maybe you already see it now. Over here on the left side, we've got our show hide all, so it's going to collapse some lines for you that it's not actually looking at, and it tells you, you know, how much time um, your, uh, your actual program took to run, okay? Uh, next here, this is kind of uh, one of the new version things, these lightning bolts and explosion emojis. This is how and where you would click to get your open AI suggestions. Okay, so what you would do to uh, interface with that is up in the top right up here, there's advanced options. What you have to do is put in an uh, uh, API key for, you know, your standard open AI stuff, and then you'll click these buttons and it'll give you code suggestions in line, which I, I think is pretty awesome. Okay, so over here on the left side, now we're looking more at the breakdowns per line. We see that um, we have our time breakdown, light blue, more better, dark blue, more slower. Okay, same thing for the greens there. And what we have um, that might be a little bit interesting is this sawtooth pattern of allocation, not for line four here, which kind of makes sense as, as we go, as we're going through the for loop, but what we have here is this sawtooth with a whole bunch of copying on this NP array, NP random uniform. Okay, so let's talk about actually what this copying means to just be explicit. This is copying that's done and the unit is megabytes. And what we're talking about here is that there's a whole bunch of copying going on in um, the memory space of this structure over and over again. It's totally possible that this is valid Right, that you need to do this to you know pass your data back and forth um, in your program, but that sure seems like a lot for for a test problem that doesn't actually seem to require it. Okay, so there there's your next hint. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to switch over to actually what the the web UI is going to look like. Okay, so now and hopefully everyone can see this. Yes, great. Um, as as I mouse over things in in the uh, in the project here, I'm getting my suggestions. It's telling me these peak memory values. I'm highlighting all of these fields. I'm not going to click these buttons because I don't have my AI, open AI key in there, and I don't want you guys to steal it, <laughs> right? But what we have here is this particular line, which is saying that there's a whole bunch of native memory being allocated, and it, there's a whole bunch of copying, but we don't know why it really shouldn't be like that. Okay. And it turns out that scaling is correct. NP random uniform already returns a numpy array, an np.array. It already returns one. So 
casting it again or calling this function on, on it again with MP array, the way that that function is implemented is it is a deep copy of whatever structure you give it. You give it a list, it's now an MP array. You give it an MP array, it's another MP array. It doesn't matter. And that is where we get our copying from. Okay, so if I go up here, I have this uh, in a solved example already. Okay, if I take out that function call, all of a sudden our sawtooth uh, pattern in this particular line disappears and we've dropped almost four seconds. Okay, so the next thing that Scalene would point you to is exactly this function here, this range 10 to the seven. Definitely problematic. It's showing that we're spending a whole bunch of memory in Python. So that's what you would want to attack next. And that's the sort of thing that Scalene is going to help you find in your own code base. Okay, so let's just let's just talk about that to regroup really quickly. Uh, in, in my opinion, I, I was already sold when I saw this test example on Scalene and, and using it on my own code base. It, it helped us catch what would honestly be uh, like a totally invisible error in, in most cases, right? Like that's the kind of code that you would, you would copy paste from somewhere on something like Stack Overflow and you'd be like, great, it works. And you would never know to check it ever again, right? So it also provided us with some really nice timings. It suggested the other places to remove with that range 10 to the seven. And it gave us our nice breakdowns as well as those peaks and valleys of memories. So that's definitely going to help you, you know, with your job kind of request, like how much memory you're going to use. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, we're moving a little bit fast here on, on problem number two, as I want to have a decent uh, amount of time for questions and some discussion. Um, but problem two, we're going to do a standard prime sieve, okay? So I'm going to explore things as if it's in um, on a notebook running uh, on one of the Alliance clusters. It's totally possible. You can go look at the wiki and everything will work for you. I'm not going to do that right now because there were some problems with me trying to get this demo together um, last night and running these sorts of things on, on the cluster. So let's go over here and we're going to look at problem two because I promised you the ability to um, use Scalene inside of a Jupyter notebook in my abstract for the talk. So we're definitely going to do that. And it is as simple as a lot of other um, Jupyter notebook extensions. You load the extension via Scalene and it does give you a disclaimer and that is that CPU and GPU profiling are the only things that are supported. Okay, and it kind of makes sense and think back to how I explained how the memory um, system worked. If Jupyter is on top of what's executing, it makes it really, really difficult for scaling to profile what's going on with the memory. OK, but here we have a very, very basic prime sieve. It's as basic as I could possibly make it. And uh, the disclaimer is I even used, I used chat GPT to generate this exact code. And the reason for that is it's as generic as possible. Okay, we've all seen this sort of thing before. It's the prime wheel. If you're not familiar, tab over to Wikipedia and go look up the, the prime sieve. Okay, so we run it with this magic uh, cell method. Great. Um, I've verified it does work and we're per, uh, provided with a little bit of an inline thing here. Um, it's zoomed in quite a bit because I'm zoomed in on my notebook, but we're presented with the exact same thing. Just the timings are in um, uh, in this because it's just the CPU profiling, okay? And unsurprisingly, of course, what we're seeing is that everything is spent in Python. Yes, <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> Definitely only Python here. Okay, great. And now, Kind of as a spoiler, um, I'll not not really a spoiler because we're going to get to it right now. I also got a vectorized version of this, and I can run it. Runs fairly quickly because I'm just doing up to 10 million. And what we see in this particular case is we're spending a lot more time in uh, native code. In fact, pretty much the majority of what we've done since we're only doing um, primes under 10 million is is importing. Okay, and it's much, much faster. So if I just look, this was 341 milliseconds and the base Python was 2.6 seconds. And that of course is just gonna scale wildly as, as things go up. Okay, I'm not gonna talk so much about how to write this kind of code as it's, it's a stylistic thing and there's lots of other Sharknet talks on it, but I've we've, we've definitely delivered here on our <laughs> inside of a Jupyter notebook experience. So you can 
you know, write your test functions. But this isn't the ideal use case. We really like the memory feature. I think that's the killer feature of scaling. So we're going to return to a regular browser for that. And I will do that with uh, another window here. Awesome. So I should be able to do cc.html. Awesome. Okay. So here's the that that base sieve code. And if we you know, show all of the lines, what we're actually seeing now is the entire memory consumption. So if you're doing a job um, on the cluster, you'll be able to look at this sort of thing and figure out how much memory you should request, which is awesome as far as I'm concerned. Here's your max. You know, maybe you'd want to go 20% bigger than that or something, right? So if we look, kind of unsurprisingly, this is prime true times n plus one is where all of the memory is being consumed absolutely all of it. And then last but not least, right here at the very end, as in this for loop, we declare, um, you know, this range operator, that's also a memory allocation. All right, so now I'm, I'm I've got that vectorized version. So I'm just going to bring that up. Uh, vectorized. And I, I don't want to talk again about like how you would vectorize we have several different code series code series talk series on that so those you can go investigate but note that right here i've got sieve of uh everything under 100 million and it's running in 1.2 seconds and the previous one it was almost 30 seconds for the same thing so it really is faster if you try and you know write python but take advantage of these native libraries and so we can see the memory allocation is much better um, the biggest memory um, contributor here this time is the return primes dot two list, so that it's our Python list. And of course, we're right back in Python memory. Makes tons of sense. Our memory footprint is also way lower because we're using an NP array for our, um, uh, you know, actual wheel. All right, and our time definitely much more time spent in uh, native code, which is awesome. And so something else I, I talked about and, and maybe might be new to you is the idea of these just-in-time compilers. Um, I don't want to, again, talk about that because we have the talk series on that. Uh, Pavel has a great one on that and Numba. But I just want to show that if you're familiar with using some of those things, that um, Scalene also plays nice with that. So I'm going to show all of my code here. This is the original this is the original sieve code that I asked ChatGPT for. It's pure Python. It's as generic as you can possibly get, right? It just implements the algorithm, does nothing else. Uh, I have the from number import JIT. So that's the just-in-time stuff. I add this decorator to the code. And if you look at that, the code runs way faster and it's still on 100 million. Um, the interesting thing is that it's showing that you are still using a decent amount of Python. And that's true because for the first few iterations of your just-in-time um, compiled code, it still is running Python, okay? It does play nice with scaling and it works well. If this is something that interests you, being able to do this sort of thing, just like add a decorator to a code and it's gonna, it's gonna run faster, definitely check out that talk on the SharkNet YouTube. Okay, so scaling definitely plays nice. All right, awesome. <laughs> I said the first line of my slide without looking at it, great. So scaling really does play nice with a wide variety of techniques. It also works with Cython. I definitely don't have time to get into that and how that works today, um, but it plays nice with all of these different things. Python's going to be slow until you, you know, put some effort into changing it up. Until you can leverage those native languages, you're just always going to be slower. Um, just in time is powerful, and, but not the focus of this talk. Okay, but definitely, I, I think I've hoped to give you. Um, a reason to try it on your own code base, even if it's using uh, all sorts of different optimization methods inside of it. Okay. So uh, today's takeaways, we want to write Python. Python is awesome. We want to stay in Python. All of the conveniences exist there, the rapid prototyping, all of these different sorts of things. We want to write Python, but we want it to be executing native code. That is where we recover the speed and we start to be competitive again. Okay. This, however, makes like problems really, really difficult to spot, right? Like that copying error. That that if you have a large 10,000 line code base that you're working with, that error definitely has to be in there somewhere or something similar, right? Scalene is going to help you do, with that sort of thing. 
Okay, and the great part about it is that it supports all sorts of different programming paradigms. I didn't cover them today because we didn't have time, but it's also going to like give you your GPU statistics and that sort of breakdown. It's got your open AI suggestions. If you're not familiar with vectorizing, it can, you know, inline make you some suggestions, all sorts of different things. Okay, so hopefully I sold you on using Scalene and, you know, that performance really matters, especially as you scale up in your HPC environment. Right, and that this is something you should do. Okay, so thanks very much for your time.